Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring trauma and the human condition. With me is Dr. Anguin St. Just, who is a social traumatologist. And uh, she approaches this field from a systems perspective. She is the author of a two-volume series of books on trauma, space, time, and fractals, which we've discussed in previous interviews, and a five-volume series called Trauma and the Human Condition. Each volume has a separate name, and the most recent of these is called Fire in the Madhouse. Welcome, Anne Gwynne. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. That really does seem like an apt metaphor for the human condition, <laughs> fire in the madhouse. Yes. That was Terence McKenna, uh, that he uh, used that phrase in one of his uh, famous rants, and it landed. Mm -hmm. I thought, yes, he, he's got it right. That's what time it is. It's fire in the madhouse, and that was 2016, hmm. and it's not changed all that much. Well, when I hear the word madhouse, yeah. it, it, it reminds me of a very striking fact. I first heard it when I was in second grade, and my teacher said, you know, students, one-third of you are going to end up seeking treatment uh, for a mental illness in your lifetime. <laughs> Oh, my. There's some predictive programming. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, when you consider the percentage of people in the population who are taking uh, anxiety medications, uh, medication for depression, medication for uh, bipolar disorder, medication for schizophrenia, and uh, and so on, you're probably talking about a third of the population. Yes, and maybe all that is some social engineering that's not all that necessary. Mm -hmm. Or so, effective. Yes, yes. Um, Although I do talk to people who say it saved my life. I've heard that too, and I'm not against medication. Mm -hmm. But I do think Big Pharma has overreached yeah. into the field of mental health Um to an alarming degree, mm -hmm. particularly in medicating children. Yeah. Uh, so it's a concern. But on the on the other hand, the human population itself is is labile, and uh, maybe it's a good thing because some of the very same people who might be diagnosed as schizophrenics uh, in one era are are the great inventors, mm -hmm. uh, the great artists, the great writers mm -hmm. in a different era. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Molly Doma, the African shaman. Mm -hmm. has, Who I've interviewed, yeah, yeah Molly Doma he, Somme. He has a very different uh, view mm -hmm. about that. And What my, is his view? That um, the madness is sacred and that it's of service to the community and that these people need to be included mm -hmm. and listened to. Yes. And, um, Certainly not marginalized or medicated. Well, he reported, you know, when I interviewed Molly Doma, yeah. he told me a story in all sincerity that was totally unbelievable, and yet I don't disbelieve it either. He said he attended his grandfather's funeral. His grandfather had died. They had a big funeral in the village of uh, Burkina Faso is yeah. the country he came from. And he said at the funeral they play... Um, xylophones yeah. or, or marimbas yeah. and it's it's a celebration and he said his uh they have a like a march to the burial ground and his dead grandfather got up and marched along with the mourners to the burial ground they said, this is normal. This is what they do. That's what the marimbas and the xylophones do. They awaken the corpse, and, and so it can walk with them to be buried. That's so not American culture. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that. 
you know. But I, I have I, interviewed many, many people who tell me unbelievable stories, and I can tell you a few. Yeah. And it seems to me, if if so many people are having these unbelievable experiences, maybe it's a mistake to dismiss these people as crazy. So here we are, trauma and the human condition. Yeah. And in thinking about this, outside of American medical protocols, mm -hmm. yes. that the truth is, the first trauma specialists were not psychologists or psychiatrists. They were the medicine people mm -hmm. and the shamans. Yes. And they knew a lot mm -hmm. about trauma and the system and the ancestors and the language of symptoms and the healing powers of nature that we are only now coming back I, to. I think we have to accept the fact that shamanism evolved probably over a period of hundreds of thousands yeah. of years before we ever had written language and what we call history. Yeah, and they were the trauma specialists. Mm -hmm. They um, and they, they're coming back now into mm -hmm. the mainstream. Shamanism is being reborn. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a healthy thing mm -hmm. because I think the psychological, psychiatric um, protocols, paradigms are uh, to some degree disconnected and culturally specific. Mm -hmm. And if you think about this planet and how many millions and billions of people on this planet are traumatized. They're not going to go sit in a chair with a therapist and talk about their feelings, nor do they have access to psychoactive drugs. So they have to find other ways without money, without these other resources, um, because the, the particularly in collective trauma, it's massive. Mm -hmm. There are not enough therapists to run around the planet, sit in chairs, and talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. It's just not realistic. So I started thinking about, okay, what have humans always known about how to heal trauma before the psychologist and the psychiatrist? Because they're late to the game. Mm -hmm. And most of what we were taught came out of a study of war trauma. Mm. Shock trauma, and that was late. That came in the, around World War One, mm. um, and then trauma was primarily seen as combat related. It was a war trauma, mm. um, shell shock. Yeah, yeah, and still not well understood. Nor did they understand a whole lot about treating it. Mm. And um, I did, at one point, four years of marriage and family training, and I had one weekend of uh, trauma where they taught us to diagnose combat trauma according to the DSM-3 or 4, whatever yes. it was in, uh -huh. in those days. Yeah. And that's such a narrow view. It's such a medical model view of trauma, because mm. trauma is integral to the human condition. It always has been. Mm -hmm. um, we talked in both of our previous interviews about the birth trauma. Yes. For example. Yes. And I thought, how do other cultures heal trauma? What is a cross-cultural resource for traumatized populations. And I think um, what I came up with is uh, primarily is nature. And I got very interested in non-psychological methods for working with trauma. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting working with combat veterans from the Vietnam era because this particular group. They were mostly bush vets. They lived out in the uh, jungles or wilderness. They uh, were too overwhelmed to deal with noise and uh, traffic and human interaction. Uh, so um, I participated in wilderness programs where we went out to them. Mm. 
and uh, they had no patience whatsoever with any kind of psychobabble. And they didn't like therapists. They'd had a very bad experience with the Veterans Administration. And they, they used to say, oh, yeah, therapists are such fine people. And what they meant was fairly incapable of normal emotion. They felt manipulated. Mm. And they felt, mis- they, they said it didn't help, that nothing helped. But they found in nature somehow they could relate to life again, starting maybe with a tree. And recalibrating their nervous system to the natural cycle. They would get up with the sun and they could sleep when they wanted, eat when they wanted, and mm-hmm. to, uh, to literally recalibrate mm-hmm. uh, a, a nervous system that had been completely blown out. Sort of returning back to our human origins as mm-hmm. hunter-gatherers. And coming from this insane, disconnected madness that's mm-hmm. war to connection into the web, mm-hmm. again, of our biological matrix. Yeah. Uh, and um, they responded very well to um, ritual and storytelling. And um, careful negotiation of connection. And at one point, so we did an exchange with Russian um, veterans of uh, the war in Afghanistan. They were very similar. Mm-hmm. They were skittish and uh, suspicious and um, not much in the way of social skills. Um But I worked with them in Russia in the forest with shamans. And it it was wonderful to see. And there was no psychological protocol uh, involved. Um, Not that I'm against psychology, but I think when you think about the planet and the different cultures here, that that model doesn't translate globally. Well, I suppose part of the problem is that what we call normal is very far from the sort of homeostasis established by our uh, ancestors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we're quite disconnected. And I thought, well, this is very interesting looking at non-psychological approaches. Mm. Um, and I think used together with psychological because uh, we have learned a few things <laughs> about uh, trauma, but um, we're le- we're still. I think we still have a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. Well, I suspect that for much of my life, if you were to ask me about trauma, yeah, I would say uh, I'm not traumatized. I've never been abused. I've never been in a serious accident. I haven't had a serious illness. I don't have any serious disabilities. I'm not experiencing financial anxieties. Uh, I'm healthy, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm already in my 70s, and I haven't missed a meal uh-huh. <laughs> in my entire life. So uh, trauma is something that only happens to other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I suspect m- many people in, un- in this circumstance might say something like that. Uh, you know, I was born after the Second World War. Uh, I Yes, I ha- I'm Jewish, so I have relatives who were killed in the Holocaust, but not any of my immediate family members. It's your tribe. Yeah. So, but but there is a tendency to want to distance ourselves mm-hmm. from from the trauma of other people, mm-hmm. and and that that's essentially what I do normally, naturally. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I, it's also very American because mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're essentially an optimistic culture. When yeah, you, so we're protected by oceans on two sides. Yeah. And um, we've never really been occupied mm-hmm. in, the, in the way that uh, Europe, East Europe... Uh, Most other countries have. Actually, yeah. 
That, you know, the, even England was occupied by the Romans at one time. Yeah, and they were bombed mm -hmm. uh, by uh, the Fourth Reich, Third Reich. Yeah. <laughs> but we had plenty of trauma here because of the genocides, because of, we had a civil war, by the way, which is not resolved. I live in a country that uh, was built uh, to a large degree by slave labor. Yeah. And uh, certainly before the Civil War and actually probably much more than we appreciate subsequently. Yeah. And, and uh, committed genocide against millions of mm -hmm. indigenous uh, people. So, but I don't think of that <laughs> as trauma affecting me, but of course it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And it's coming around again, mm -hmm. because now when we have this uh, resurgence of fascism, it's aligned with the Confederates, with the Klan, and with the us and them, and the North and the South, and the racism, and here we are again, because it was never really resolved. Mm-hmm. And that's collective trauma, and we're in the collective. Yeah. And uh, well, the lessons of history seem to keep repeating themselves over and over again. Because are they ever digested? That's a good question. Because I think if they're digested, they don't represent. Because there's no reason to. Mm -hmm. Because it's resolved. Yeah. But as long as, for example, Americans who hear all of this, we are exceptional people. We're the guys in the white hats. We're the good guys. Those are the bad guys elsewhere. The bad guys are only from elsewhere. Yeah, American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's not how the rest of the world sees us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the whole question of trauma, I think it's intrinsic to our biology that we have this nervous system that's triune, which is compartmentalized, mm -hmm. and, you know, we have the neocortex, which we think is our brain, yeah. <laughs> But they're the, the subcortical yes. uh, structures. There's, when you say the triune brain, I think mm -hmm. what you mean is the, the brain stem, the reptilian brain, mm -hmm. the limbic system, the mm -hmm. mammalian brain, yeah. and then the cortex, the uh, human. The, yeah, that's us, right? You know, yeah. we're all cortex. Yeah. The two hemispheres. Yeah. So what happens in trauma, um, <clears throat> physiologically, is it, it, trauma is not a cognitive experience mm -hmm. necessarily, yeah. as a matter of fact. Because we are smooth primates, when we experience threat, what often happens is the cortex shuts down mm -hmm. and the deeper brains react. Yeah. And the deepest brain is pretty primitive. Mm -hmm. And we have three options in the reptilian, which is fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. And these brains are comp compartmentalized. So we may think we would react in a certain way, but when the threat actually comes, the reptile takes over, yeah. and we find ourselves in an autonomic reaction where we sometimes get stuck. Well, you, you know, um, and when I was at one time threatened uh -huh. by attackers mm -hmm. who, who came into my bedroom... Uh, in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and uh, were told me they planned to kill me and threw a knife at me. Oh, my goodness. It happened. Yeah. Uh, they actually were people I knew. But uh, I became possessed at that moment by what I have to call a higher consciousness. I felt like Jesus Christ, I have to tell you. I, I was in bed, so I got out of bed stark naked. Yeah. And I just looked at those people, and they turned around, and uh, they were frightened of me uh, in my innocent nakedness and, and walked away. But I was uh, possessed by something outside of myself. It felt outside of myself, mm -hmm. and it was no fear. In, and nor was I uh, aggressive in, in the least. I simply stood up very 
calmly and peacefully, and that was more than they could handle. And oh, yeah. So, so we have, it's not well understood, I'm sure, in, in uh, the neurological aspects of it, but we do have what some people call superconsciousness. And the bottom line is, mm-hmm. when you're threatened, yeah. does your reaction work? Mm-hmm. And in your case, it worked. Yeah. And if it works, you don't have trauma. Mm-hmm. Where you have trauma is when it doesn't work. Yeah. So what you did, instinctively, spiritually, whatever it was, worked. Yeah. It, it did work, but I can tell you, I was attacked. I, I mean, yeah. I, they threw boiling hot water on me uh, uh, before they <laughs> cowered and, and walked away. But what you did yeah. worked. It did work. And that's why the, that's a shock. Yeah. Okay. A shock is not the same as trauma necessarily. Okay. Okay. So shock is a shock. And, you know, right. getting hot water thrown on you is in your, in your bed and you're sleeping. Oh my God. That's a shock. Yeah. But then your strategy mm-hmm. for survival yeah. worked. Yes, it did. And, if it hadn't worked, then you would have trauma. I see. Okay? Because what gets stuck is what you didn't do. Mm. Okay? If you needed to run and you couldn't, if you needed to fight and you couldn't, you would freeze, perhaps, then you would have trauma. But yeah. what you did worked. Yeah. So, you don't have trauma. You had mm-hmm. shock. Mm-hmm. And shock doesn't automatically evolve into trauma. Mm. It passes. And when you, I mean, it's very powerful to know that they were scared of you yeah. and that their uh, agenda did not happen. Right, and I don't have any lingering wound from that incident. No, because uh, you had a shock, yeah. but you didn't have trauma. Uh-huh. And that's the difference. Mm-hmm. Because every experience does not automatically traumatize us. Good point. Even even experiences that might traumatize another person. That's right. Mm-hmm. It depends on do your defenses work. Okay. And if they do, then life goes on. Mm-hmm. But if you needed to do something else, uh, then you have trauma. For example, for women get raped. No. And they want to fight, but they couldn't. No. But they feel they should. Yes. Um, then they have shame, mm. and then they have trauma. But if they fight and they escape, they have shock, but not trauma. I see. And the tricky thing is, sometimes when you're in a situation like that, your best defense is to freeze. But we have a belief system sometimes that we should fight even though we froze. Mm. And then you have trauma. And the healing is to understand that what you did worked. Because I should have run, but you couldn't. Freezing, you survived. Mm -hmm. It worked. And then it's like, oh, I can defend myself. Well, you point out uh, in our earlier discussions about time and space and yeah. trauma that mm-hmm. we we are affected by traumas that took place a long time ago and far, far away. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And um, now we know that there's biological reason for that. Because on the physiological level, we know we have epigenetic evidence that unresolved trauma is like plaque on the genes. So oh. Now, early on, when the epigenetics discovered that like seven generations of rats would have the symptoms from their ancestors, they believed it was only coming through um, the mother. Uh-huh. But the latest research is that it's also transmitted in the sperm. So it comes from both. In other words, if uh, 
It used to be thought yeah. that you cannot change your genes. The genes yeah. simply get passed on, or if they get changed, it's through some sort of a, a mutation, like mm-hmm. cosmic rays coming in, mutating your genes. But mm-hmm. now we know that through this new field of mm-hmm. epigenetics, yeah. that genes actually uh, are modified in subtle ways mm-hmm. by a variety of factors. Yeah. And didn't Bruce Lipton say something about um, genes have potential that can be activated or deactivated? Yes. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, now we bring something like free will into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's getting more complicated. It is. This, a, it, it, and there is even, uh, in fact, I have an interview scheduled uh, some weeks in the future uh, by my old friend Ken Pelletier, who is a new book out called Change Your Genes, Change Your Life. We can consciously affect our gen- genes. Yeah, we can. I think the medicine people knew that. Mm-hmm. And I read his book years ago, and he was one of the first... Um, to suggest there was a correlation between our personality traits and the pattern of symptoms Mm -hmm. that we would develop, that these symptoms did not fly in from Mars, but that they had something to do with the way that we orient ourselves in in the world. You're probably, Uh, you're talking about Ken Pelletier, his earlier book, Mind is Healer, Mind is Slayer. That's the one. Yeah. He was very early on to this. Yes, he was. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then there was uh, Larry... Darcy? No, him too, mm-hmm. but um, he was older. Senior moment. It'll come back. Um, again, the same thing, that symptoms are messages. Mm-hmm. And as messages, they're opportunities. La- Larry Lashon. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, wonderful man. Yes. And uh, he was on the same wavelength. Uh, about this. Yes. So about trauma, too, we also have options. Mm-hmm. Um, how we want to hold the experience of being overwhelmed. And again, then we get into victim consciousness, yeah. which is not conducive to healing. The point we made in our previous interview is mm-hmm. worth repeating, is that <laughs> victimization is real, victim consciousness is not. Well, it's real, but it's not healing. Yeah. And it leads to violence. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's often based on, I think, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think victim consciousness is, is based on a misunderstanding of the situation. And to some extent, um, culturally uh, conditioned. Um, that you should be, you should feel this way, you should live this there way. There are secondary benefits yeah. that suck people into yeah. the consciousness of the victim. Well, though, if you look at the Japanese culture, there are no benefits there. They're shunned. Mm-hmm. And, I think and they still do it? Is that what you're saying? Because the Hibakusha are still alive. Mm-hmm. The people who were... Um, damaged Uh-oh. through the atomic bombs, they're still alive. Yeah, yeah. And they're still... Shunned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Treated like lepers. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so there's a cultural factor, too, telling mm-hmm. you how you should respond to an overwhelming life event where you are a victim. Mm-hmm. And... <clears throat> How many people know their options about that? I mean, what what does the religion tell you about it? What does the tribe tell you about it? What does mm-hmm. your therapist tell you about <laughs> it? <laughs> As I see it, this is Earth, and trauma is integral to the human experience because we are not machines. Yeah. And... The degree to which it affects us, the degree to which it shapes us, varies greatly according to culture. Mm -hmm. And looking at the larger picture with the human condition, there are what you might call the greater forces. Mm -hmm. And these greater forces are rarely acknowledged in therapy. 
or even family therapy. How many family therapists ask the client, was anybody in your family ever in a war? They don't. They ask about personalities and... Sexual and, patterns. Yeah. <laughs> and when you think about the degree to which war shapes family systems, cultures, clans, tribes nations for mm -hmm. generations, it's never mentioned. It's one of the greater forces that contributes to collective mm. trauma. And, and surely if you study history, it's very much about battles and war. Oh, yeah. And then when you have war, you have epidemics. Mm. And then you have immigration and emigration. Mm -hmm. And then you have natural disasters as well. Yeah. Does any therapist ever ask, was anybody in your family ever in an avalanche, a tsunami, a, no, an earthquake? But these major, I mean, look at what just happened in Japan with that uh, March 11th tsunami and quake. Thousands of people were, uh, families uh, overwhelmed, and that will go on for generations. Mm -hmm. Now, are, are you referring to the tsunami and quake that led to the Fukushima disaster? Yes. Mm -hmm. Plus, you have the radiation, which is changing their genome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, so, and spreading out into the Pacific Ocean. 300 tons every day. Day. And, and retouching, in effect, every continent. Yeah, because this is a water planet, mm -hmm. and it's round. So the radiation travels yeah. in the currents, and mm -hmm. then it's picked up in the clouds, and it comes down in rain on the land. So the radiation levels uh, globally mm -hmm. are increasing. Yeah. And I would say, <clears throat> at this point, the radiation has become one of the greater forces that are, um, I don't know quite how to put it, shaping, I think. Maybe maybe the human future, maybe the human genome. In, in a very big way, I would say, and not just from Fukushima. Yeah. Uh, people who, who know me well would know that one of my best friends over the years was Dean Brown, a physicist who... who been deceased now for over a decade, but uh, he studied uh, at the Institute for the Advanced Studies in Princeton. What are mm -hmm. the biggest threats facing humanity today? And in his opinion, the single biggest threat was nuclear waste. I agree. We don't know where to put it yet, and, and it's leaking into the environment all mm -hmm. over. That's right, because look at all the atomic testing we did in the South Pacific. Yeah which is still there. Yep. Plus, the Russians were doing a lot of uh, atomic testing, mm -hmm. and so were the French in the South yes. Pacific. And, and, and in Nevada. <laughs> in Nevada. And, and even here in New Mexico. <laughs> yes, definitely. You mm -hmm. have this problem of where to put it. And, yeah. um, so I would say that this is an environmental trauma. Mm -hmm. I think that's one way to put it. Yeah. But then... There's the question, like, how did it come to this? And there was something about splitting the atom. Mm -hmm. That the, there was some kind of disconnection there. Well, you know, it reminds me of the phrase uh, Francis Bacon, one of the founders of modern science, who described what were the scientific endeavor. We're going to put nature on the rack and torture her. Well... Yeah, so this is coming from some anti-life perversity. That's one way to look at it. Yeah. But, you know, from a biological perspective, if we look at evolution as a whole, long before humans evolved on this planet, other species created... Uh, traumatic problems for themselves. The, I understand the earliest cells on this <laughs> planet were um, 
anaerobic, mm -hmm. and they poured into the planet a poison that nearly killed them off completely. It was oxygen. Yeah. And what happened is they mutated. Mm -hmm. Instead of oxygen being a poison, now oxygen is essential. And I have the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually set this up at a conference in Mexico City. Um, man, woman, radiation, present time, and man, woman, 200 years. And um, radiation was neutral. It wasn't like uh, behaving as a predator or any. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. The problem is how we used it. Yeah. But now it's everywhere. Mm. But it wasn't malevolent as such. It's just like, well... You know, it is. Radiation. Yeah. Um, the humans in the future, downloading from the Akashic field, they said, um, we're fine, we're different, we're not very interested in you, hmm. looking back. And apparently, we're going to mutate. And some of us are going to make it, and some of us aren't, because that's yeah. what has yeah. always happened on the planet when there have been environmental changes. Yeah. Some species make it, and some but, mutate. And, and we human beings are already responsible for the death, or, or uh, maybe genocide is a better word, of mm -hmm. many, many other species. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and now we're moving into space. Mm -hmm. And w Which is full of radiation. I mean, our atmosphere protects us from a lot of the radiation pouring in from space. Oh, we're going to need a version of us that can tolerate that. Yeah. So, if you take the big picture, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, well, it's process. It, well, it was Nietzsche who said, if it doesn't kill you, it will make you stronger. Yeah. However, I think we're at where we are right now. It's a crisis point because we don't know. Yeah. And in my work, I would hope that, because I travel a lot internationally and work with many different cultures and countries, that I think for me at this point it's important to see trauma as integral to the human condition and not see it as a diagnosis only that's given to certain people if they have um, a shock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we use the word trauma, so, that, you know, I'm the worst one when if my computer crashes, I say, oh, you know, I have, <laughs> I have a computer trauma, and, and of course I don't. Yeah. I I, I am frustrated, I'm upset, uh, but I'm not traumatized. Yeah. But it's like this traumatizes me, that trauma. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. it's not true. But as humans, I think we need to look at trauma and the human condition in relation to the greater forces that are shaping our experience here on this planet. Mm -hmm. And Gwen St. Just, that's a very apt way to put it. <laughs> and once again, this has been uh, not always an easy conversation, but an enlightening one. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with me and for taking the time and the trouble and the expense of coming here to Albuquerque for these interviews. It's, they've been very rewarding. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.